Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and, and the group of mainly boys at the back of the, the room. Um, you're all very welcome here this evening. Um, and this is uh, the second, and following this will be the third event that the Donegal Gap Heritage and History Group have put on for this year's Heritage Week. Um, before I say anything else, would you turn off your mobile phones if you have them on or whatever. Uh, so, um, this evening we have the, the great pleasure of having a talk by Liam Dolan, um, who was Professor of Botany in Oxford University and is currently teaching in Vienna. And he is regarded as one of the leading botanists in the entire world. <laughs> um, so we are really So without any further ado, I'm going to ask Liam to give his presentation. And thank you very much. Thanks, Paula. And it's a great pleasure. And thanks for coming in tonight, uh, everybody. But, uh, I thought I'd do today is to just use the presentation to explore the diversity of plants and the importance in our lives. And as we all know, because you know, you're here, so you're obviously already converted, but the earth is a garden. And that garden is abundant with forms most beautiful, as, as Darwin said. And what I'd like to do is to explore some of that diversity, but emphasize how it relates to this local environment and the history of this place that we find ourselves in southwest uh, Donegal in particular. So the fact that the earth is a garden is an accident of nature. If all of the planets followed the rules of physics, we would look like Venus. This is Venus, formed just over 4.6 billion years ago. It's got a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere, just like the Earth did. It's a sister planet. But one thing changed on Earth that never changed on that planet, and that's life. Life emerged, and this planet is dead. It's a runaway greenhouse effect. There's no water, the water's all been boiled off. It's so hot that the water's been split into its components. Half of them have gone off into space, and the other half have re reacted with the surface to form a rusty surface. Earth is different. If you were an alien passing through the solar system in, an air, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a spaceship, you'd look at Venus and say, yeah, that's what should be going on. And then you'd look at this and say, gosh, there's something really queer going on here. What is it? And the what is it is life. Here, you can see there's, there's blue. That blue is water, so the water is still here, so it's a cool planet. And what I really want to focus on tonight is the green bits, is the plants. And the plants are important because they are ultimately responsible for cooling the planet. We would be like Venus if it wasn't for plants. And the reason is that there's green things that grow on the continental sources, on the land, and there are green things that grow in the sea. And so this is a photograph taken of Crofulla, bloody foreland. We're looking east, there's muckish there. We're off down here, the other side of the van. And the green things grow by taking the sunlight, the energy of sunlight, combining it and using that to make sugar from carbon dioxide and water in the atmosphere. So remember, carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere of Venus. That dead gas has been pulled and turned into sugar by plants. And this is the first of a few NASA photographs that I'll, I'll show you tonight. And what's important about this is the green bits are where there are plants. There are green bits on the continental surfaces. So we're here, very green. But there's also green bits in the ocean. <clears throat> and so that reaction that I talked about where plants take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, they also release oxygen back. Half of that takes place on the land and half of it takes place in the oceans. And if it wasn't for the plants, we wouldn't have oxygen in the atmosphere and we wouldn't hear any look like Venus. So this is a view of the Earth and what I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about is really what's going on in these 
surfaces. And this is where the plants that I'm going to talk about are. So I told you at the beginning that Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. We've only had plants growing for 500 million years old. So plants evolved relatively recently. They're almost an afterthought in the, in the history of the planet. And what I want you to see here is that before plants, there were continents. But those continents all looked like that. They were all pretty bare. There was nothing. They, in, for all intents and purposes, they looked like Venus. So there was, there was no carbon fixation. There was no energy being delivered here. But then, within 100 million years of plants first crawling out of the water and onto the surfaces, we had tall trees and we had jungles, and we had the first forests. And the reason I'm going to jump to the first forest is because there's fossil evidence for some of the earliest forests with large trees in this area. So this is an artist's reconstruction of what these first forests look like. These are forests from what's called the Carboniferous period, so this is about 340 million years ago. And you can see plants here that are giant horse tails or giant mare's tails. Uh, and then you can see these other plants here. And now these plants you'll find in all of the lakes that are grown around here, but they now grow to about this size. Okay? So they still exist. So they've been around for over 300 million years, but they're still here. So. Mm -hmm. We have this view of forests, but the reason we have this view of the forest is because we've got fossils that told us about those plants. And there's a locality near here that's familiar to all of you, where the evidence of those forests exists. So this is Sleeve League. We're looking uh, from Bunglas. And what I want you to see here is that if you stand and look at these cliffs, you find that most of the rocks are running that way. Okay, So the, the lines are in the rocks are that way. So what that means is when rocks are laid down, they're laid down like that. Okay, But when the continents collided and formed these mountains about 400 million years ago, it caused the mountains to crumple. And so then these layers that were like that went up like that. Okay. And so this is the, these were as high as the Himalayas, and then they've been worn down ever since. But if you now look at the very top of Sleeve Bay, you can see that there's a bunch of rocks here that look different. They're about 10 metres thick, and there the layers are horizontal. And this, here's those rock, close up of these rocks, they're running that way. Okay. And then this is the top, this is what these rocks look like when they're on the top. So we're looking to the northwest. Lakhwava here, Malambeg here, and what I'm going to show you are fossils that exist in these rocks here. So when you're walking along the top of Shlidli, you look down, you'll see these fossils. Okay, so this is my finger for scale. But what I want you to see, you see these spots here? And so the edge of this organism is here and down here. So it looks a bit like a snake that's that wide and it's running across. That's the fossilized remains of a part of a plant and that was growing roots from these little spots here. And what you can't see here, but from another fossil that we worked on, and this is now in the um, museum, the Natural History Museum in Manchester, you can get another view of this. So we've got a horizontal stem here, and then these are the roots that are growing out into that. Uh, into the surrounding substrate. But by using fossils of the sort that we found on the top of Schlieveik, we've been able to reconstruct the rooting system of these structures. So these are the, the plants. This is what they would have looked like. They look a bit like palm trees. They're not palm trees, but they've got a massive leaves on the top. And then they were anchored by these structures here. And the snake-like structure that I showed you is this bit here. And then the little dots on the surface are producing these blue roots. Now, these fossils have been known about for 200 years, but we never knew that they had roots like this until we started studying them recently. And 
The formation of this very dense network of roots explains how these tall trees stood up. Because the mechanics of this, the physicists tell us that these plants shouldn't stand up. They were too tall, they should just fall over. But these roots acted like guy ropes and they held the plants in place. And so if you ever want to see them, there's evidence of them up on the top of sleeve leaf. How tall were the trees? Up to 50 metres. Really? Yeah. So they're the first 50 metre trees. The majority of them were, would have been between 5 and 35. But these were the first 50 metre trees to evolve. So the question is, can we get more information out of this little set of rocks that are at the top? Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to propose an hypothesis. Okay? So this is a model for what we think might have got, gone on. It's not saying this is what happened, but it's what we think happened, and then we can go and do more studies to test it. So one model is, one hypothesis is, is that these rocks here sat below the level of the sea. And I've indicated sea level here with a yellow line. Okay. And we know they were below the sea because those sorts of limestones are only produced today in places that have hot water uh, in tropical oceans, like Barbados. So you see these sorts of places there. They form these sorts of limestones, they're full of shellfish. And then what we think happened then was sea level dropped, or the land rose. We don't know which. Sea level could have dropped if it was a cold period and there was more ice, or the land could have dropped. And then what happened is these bits of land were now dry land, and the trees started to grow there. And then the trees sent out the roots through this limestone, what became limestone, it would have been a, a, a marly mud back then. And then we think that that's what happened then, but we're not sure. Okay. But like I say, this is an hypothesis, but we can go and check it. Okay. So that's a piece of information that you can glean from looking at fossilized plants from this area. Now, the landscape, the, the southeast, southwest Donegal, has been sculpted by ice. So the ice, the area would have been covered in ice until about 20,000 uh, years ago, and then gradually it receded. So 15,000 years ago, we would have been in a place like Greenland, and then by 9,000 years ago, uh, it would have been a tundra vegetation here. And the landscape uh, reflects this. So a bridge lives down here, <laughs> and this is a glacial valley, so there would have been glaciers up across, they would have emptied out down this valley and out into the sea here. And it's important to remember that this glacial event was happening here, but the, the entire earth was warming up at this stage, stage. So the consequences of the earth warming had consequences for the local vegetation here which dramatically changed from being bare rock to tundra and now to this peaty uh, landscape. But it also had an impact on human society. <coughs> and one of the places it had an impact on human society is, is a long way from our dra. It's in the Middle East. This is the so-called fertile present. So this is the land of the Bible. This is also the land where barley evolved was domesticated, it's where wheat was domesticated. And so a lot of the crops that we and Western society depend on originated here. And they were domesticated by people as the ice retreated and as the planet got warmer. So there's a correlation between climate change and human society and the domestication of crops. And this is a, a range of the crops that were domesticated there. Barley grown a lot, um, East Donegal. Wheats, these sorts of wheats aren't grown in Ireland. Um, and then, but flax is very big and important for the local economy uh, here. And then others, chickpeas and, and lentils. Okay, so there are examples. Now, as I said, the warming event was a global event. It didn't just happen in the Fertile Crescent. It happened around the world. And I was talking about the Fertile Crescent here, the Southwest Asia, and that's where crops, wheat and pea, um, they were approximately um, 
was around you know, 10,500 years ago. This is BC, you know, before the Common Era, so add 2,000 year, years and you get years ago. So 10,000 years ago, wheat, peas there. But at the same time, we're getting domestication events in China, Central America, in the Andes, and in Eastern North America. So gradually over you know, 5,000 years, we see these domestication events. Now the reason I'm talking about these domestication events is that the domestication events that took place in the Andes has been hugely important to the culture of this country uh, for at least 300 years, but certainly in the last 150 uh, years. And that's because of the potato. So the potato was domesticated originally around 5,000 years ago in western Bolivia, southern Peru. Uh, and this is one of the oldest herbarium specimens that um, I had access to when I worked at Oxford. And so my predecessor is uh, Robert Morrison, who was the first professor of botany in Oxford. And this is his collection. And this is a potato that he actually collected from Virginia in the United States, in what became the United States. Uh, and this is one of the oldest preserved specimens <coughs> that we have of those potatoes that first came over uh, in the late 1500s. Now, the reason the potato was so uh, useful was that it was easy to cultivate and it produced a large amount of calories in the form of the tuber. And this is a, an early illustration from 1777 showing that the salient factors in that the potato itself is, is bigger than the rest of the plant to emphasize that. But of course, I don't need to tell anybody here about the catastrophe that happened here because of political neglect uh, and rampant market exploitation. The biological reason for the Great Famine was the failure of the potatoes. But it's always important to remember that's the biological reason, it's not the political reason. The biological reason was because of the emergence of a really unusual disease. And that was the potato blight. So, Phytophthora infestans. So, this pathogen is a pathogen that the European potatoes had never seen before, they'd never interacted with them. And the origin of the, the potatoes that were grown in Europe at that time is from this part of South America. Recent DNA data where samples of DNA have been isolated from old herbarium sheets from three or four hundred years old, like the one I showed you, shows that the pathogen arose in this part of the world. Okay, so this is an example where you have a pathogen that has existed here. It infects potato relatives. And they will together have co-evolved. So the potato relatives will have evolved resistance to this pathogen. And the pathogen will have evolved ways of getting around that. So there was an arms race. So these are in equilibrium. But the potatoes down here have never seen the pathogen from here. So they've got no resistance. But the pathogen and the potato, or the pathogen and the host, meet for the first time in the Northern Hemisphere. So the first reports are from New York, Philadelphia in 1843. 1845, the first report is in Belgium, and then Dublin, and then we know what happened then. But what happens here is that plants from this part of the world, the pathogen spread from here over to here, the potato was brought from here to here, and then they meet. And the potato has no resistance. Okay? So while in the wild down here the potato is fine, once it's found, it's co-located with the pathogen, it's got no resistance, and it completely wipes out everything. This is exactly what happened with HIV. HIV virus is a virus of a sort of African monkey. The monkeys are resistant to it. They've evolved resistance. That virus jumped into humans. Humans had no resistance, and it ran rife through uh, populations. And this is exactly the same phenomenon that we're seeing here. 
So the question is, how, how have scientists, plant breeders, been able to generate potatoes that are growing in fields around today? Well, the reason is, is that they've been able to identify resistance genes and introduce them to the potato. So what they do is, I told you that the, the, the fungus-like organism that causes blight grows here. So what they've done is they've taken a potato relative that grows in the same area, and that will have evolved resistance. And then they take that plant, and then they cross it to potato, and then they introduce the resistance genes that way. And so it turns out that there's a, a potato relative, it's actually a cherry tomato, that's resistant to late blight. And they cross the cherry tomato to the potato, and all of the resistant cultivars that you see growing around all of Europe have got their resistance genes through this sort of route. So a little bit of knowledge can be used to then develop the cultivars. And so this is, this is an old example of one of these cherry tomatoes. The particular species is Solanum pimpinella folia. And it's still the resource, the source of new resistance for the, the potato. So what I wanted to get across there is that while we have this diversity of plants in the world, and within each species there's a huge diversity. If you now take a small sample of that diversity during domestication, you're going to miss a lot of genes that could be useful. And so one of the challenges today is to harness that diversity, harness that biodiversity for the good of humanity, but also the good uh, of the, the planet. And people are constantly finding new ways to generate this diversity. So one lesson we have is that there's high genetic variation, very variety in the places where these plants originate. Domestication selects a tiny amount of that, and it may be necessary later to introduce some of that. So that's a, an example of how the meeting of a pathogen with a crop was was, was catastrophic. But this is something that's happening all the time. And sometimes humans are involved and sometimes they're not. And we call these invasive species, so they're species that come in from outside and then they spread like wildfire. And this one we're going to talk about invasive pathogens. And we're in the midst of Armageddon around uh, Ardra at the moment. Um, it, and I'll, I'll tell you why. <laughs> So, this is um, the road between Mahra and Ardra, and there's a lovely clump of three trees at Mullet and the Garden, and there's a sycamore here, there's an ash here, and there's a witch elm here. Okay, so most of the elms in the southern part of Ireland have disappeared in my lifetime with Dutch elm disease. Uh, but there are a few elms that are hanging on, and this is the only elm that I've seen in the air. I'm sure there are more, but this is the only one I've seen. And I've lived in, in England for many years, and I've never seen a proper elm tree. And so this is a gem. So, so keep your eyes open. This is the, the plant. It's probably about 40 to 60 years old, judging from the, the girth. Um, and the leaf shape is really diagnostic, the teeth. And the reason I'm explaining this is I want you to go out and see if you can find any. Okay? <laughs> so you've got these so pointy leaves with teeth and this is a close up. And very often they develop this speckling late in the season uh, on them. So this is, you know, almost glabber. It's the native uh, elm, uh, in, in, in in Irish. And the reason I'm talking about this plant is that this is a plant that has withstood waves of disease over the, the years. So during the 60s and 70s, Dutch elm disease came through and killed most of the plants in the island. Um, but by looking at lake cores and the remains of plants over thousands of years that have been laid down at the bottom of the lakes, we know that Dutch elm disease has come through in the past, like over the last 20,000 years. 
So this looks like it's a recurrent wave that happens. And as a result, we've got very few witch elms left at the moment, but maybe in a few hundred years there'll be more, and then the disease will come through again. So I'm using this as an example of a disease that comes through and wipes a lot of stuff out. But this is the Armageddon that I'm talking about. So this is a road between the, the Nard Valley. Um, and so what you can see here is dead branches. Okay, that's an ash tree. Yeah. Okay. And this is nearby again in our valley, and these branches are entirely bare. And then this tree looks as though it's got ivy growing up. Actually, but it's not ivy. The majority of that stuff is, is uh, ash leaves. So the leaves are forming quite near the trunk of the tree. And that's the dieback. So the edges of the tree are leafless but the center of the tree stays alive, and then eventually this tree will die. And then here's an example of a tree where almost all the leaves are gone. And so now that I've pointed this out to you, if you, you, when you're going home, just look at the sides of the road and you see there's trees dying all around. And the, this is a, a disease, it's a fungus disease, that was first reported in Ireland in 2012 and it's been gradually spreading uh, across but it ar arrived in, in Central Europe around the 1990s and it's been killing basically every ash in North Central Europe since then so it's 99% uh, lethality in Scandinavia for example so there's almost no ash the genetics of the ash in Ireland is slightly different, so the hope is there may be some resistance, but I actually think it's unlikely that there would be much resistance. So, the reason all of our ash are dying is that they've got no resistance to this disease, just like the potato blight situation. The pathogen originated in Japan and China thought to be transported to Europe in contaminated wood shipments and then it's spread across Europe and it's by the wind uh, as well as through contaminated plants and it's arrived here. Now the ash in China, Japan, has evolved resistance so they can cope with it. European ash has never seen this organism before, there's no resistance at all so it's been uh, wiped out. So the question then is <coughs> You know, what's going to happen, woodlands of the site that you get around Ardra, where ash has been a major part of that woodland, and then in the central part of Ireland, which is under, uh, where the limestone uh, underlies all the vegetation, that's the dominant plant there. So what happens? And it turns out, from studies that have been done in England, that the ash is likely to be in replaced not by a native but by another invasive plant okay. and now I'm going to talk about invasive plant species here's our sycamore that I was telling you on the road to Mahra sycamore are from south and central Europe they're not natives in Ireland at all but they've been spreading and the mathematical modeling that's been done in Britain says that in areas where ash has been dominant ash is going to die and it's going to be replaced by sycamore. Um, so it's a case where an invasive disease is killing a native plant and then that native plant is going to be replaced by an invasive foreign plant. But it may be a place where we're actually quite happy to have an invasive plant because if it wasn't for it, it's unclear what sort of trees will grow in, in the environment. Now ash dieback is example of an invasive disease. Sycamore is an invasive plant, but it's a pretty benign invasive plant as invasive species go. There are much more troublesome plants. <laughs> and I think this one will be recognizable to you all. So this is a case of Japanese knotweed. Uh, so this is a crop magoho and the entire, this goes on for about 200 meters. So on either side of the road, you've just got um, this um, Japanese knotweed plant. 
Now, you know, some people say, oh, it's a very pretty plant. Look at that you know, uniform color, color. Well, that makes so. However, there's nothing else growing under this. There's no native plants growing in this area here. Um, and even the trees, you know, become under pressure. So it really wipes out the local uh, biodiversity. That's Kropnogopal. Now, Japanese knotweed came from Japan uh, in the early 1800s. It ended up in Britain around 1845, and then it spread. And it was a garden plant because it's, you know, if you've got that growing in your garden, you go, great, I don't need to do any weeding. You know, so it's, you know, I, I bet it was all men who did this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, but as a result, you find that houses that are now balagi, that they're falling down in ruins. Uh, the house might be gone, but the Japanese knotweed isn't. So this is uh, the road between Strawi and Port. So Port is out this way, and we're back over here. So there's a house up here. Likely the original site where the knotweed started, and now you can see it's growing everywhere. And every year I go back, it's bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. And there, you might say, why, why is this just going so crazy? Why does it grow out of control? Well, it's taught with this, that there are insects, or at least two insects in Asia, that feed on this, and that they restrict its growth. So that... As a result, it never gets out of control there because there's always things chewing on it. But obviously those insects don't exist here, and so the plant uh, goes wild. And so then, how do we control it? Well, with great difficulty. Uh, so, late um, winter, or sorry, late, late autumn, early winter, you'll probably see this. So this is the road between Carrick and Teelham. Uh, and... This photograph was taken in, in the springtime, and this area has been sprayed for... Uh, so this area was completely covered in Japanese knotweed and was sprayed the previous autumn. So the only way we can control this at the moment is by spraying with herbicides. And the way people do it is they spray glyphosate in late summer and in the autumn. And by spraying at that time of the year, you minimize the amount of spray, but you maximize the, the effect of it. However, you've got to do it three or four years in a row, because the majority of this plant is below ground. And you know you can spray it, but you need the, the, the herbicide to go down. You can't dig it out, because you try to dig it out, you break up the plants and it spreads. Okay. So this is... Um, in a, a case of an invasive plant. So invasive organisms are not just pathogens, they can be plants, and then plants in the wrong place can cause lots of damage too. But, you know, there are some nice stories uh, to do with uh, plants, and again, they're embedded in the local heritage of the place. And the, the examples that I, I, I took were, um, for tonight, were the examples of, of local plants that have traditionally been used in, in, in medicine uh, and the, for which we, we have a good scientific uh, understanding. And you know, if you imagine you know, the pre-pharmaceutical you know, days, these were the only chemicals we had. So these were the, the sources of medicine for humans, but they were also the sources of, 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 of medicines for animals as well. So there's an extensive literature on the use of herbal medicine for animals. Uh, in the past. But there are a few common ones um, that have been used since the Greeks. And, uh, and one that most of you will have heard is, is the salicylic acid, which is effectively aspirin. Um, it's a painkiller. This is the chemical structure. The black is the carbon, and the red are the oxygens. And so you get this ring structure. Um, and it's abundant in the bark. Of, of willow. So the name salicylic acid comes from the Latin word salix, from which sally comes. Okay. So this was traditionally used as a, as a painkiller. Um, peel the bark off, um, people would stick it into a sore tooth. It's got not only um, 
it's got analgesic effects, so it, it blocks the formation of those compounds that get inflamed, that cause inflammation in wounds. Um, and it's also used because it's a weak acid. It's used for skin ailments. So if you go home and look at those very expensive creams produced by these uh, cosmetic companies, you will very often find salicylic acid in there because the weak acidic effect it helps dissolve away the outer layer of skin. There's another form uh, of salicylic acid, uh, and this is abundant, uh, and it's in this plant here, the, the, the meadow sweet, uh, for the pendula ulmaria arbidulutra. Um, and this is, produces much more salicylic acid than, 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 than the, the, the salis. And of course, it's not just the, the, the painkillers, uh, thymol that we use for colds uh, comes from thyme, and of course the <coughs> thyme, these little purple plants here, are in abundance in dune systems, which you find all along the, the coastal system here. So they're not only used as uh, to, to flavour food, but they're also used for their, their medical benefits. So. You know, these are the types of plants that people have used. And if you're interested in finding out about the uses of, of, of these plants, well, obviously, you know, there are books to go to. But there's a beautiful website that I, find, I keep going back to because I always find gems in it. And it's the dukas.ie uh, website. This is the, the folklore collection. And in Balak and the Skull, where in the 1930s, uh, children were sent to talk to the older people in their communities to bring back stories, but also bring back knowledge about everything to do with life in, 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 in those times. There's an abundance of reports about the uses of plants. And so this is a screenshot I took where I just put live in the um, herbs um, in, 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 in the Gaelic and did a search. And you can see there was, I think, and so then here's the, the list of the counties that goes down below. But under Livina, there were nearly 500 entries, and there were just less than 100 for Donegal. Yeah. So, and there's lots of beautiful stories in here. So this is my favourite page that I've come across so far. Um, so this is from Crith Island. Um, and there's... It's beautifully illustrated. Uh, there's a list of seven plants that people ha have used. Uh, a list up here and then up below is a description of how they, they use. So for example, this is Slamlus, this is Plantago lanceolata, a uh, river earth plantain. Uh, and they describe how that's used for, um, um, that's a good example. So you they take an extract of that and you put it on cuts. Um, so it's very rich in tannin. So if you've got an open wound, you squeeze the juice and it causes a scab to form effectively. So this is a very common use so, uh, of, of these sorts of plants. Tannin-rich plants, such as the plantae, put them on a wound and then they seal the wound very quickly. And then I really like this one. This is um, Slata Dua. So slatta dua is the is the sally rod, so those long slats, and then they I can't really read it. They say it's good for girthy uh, atavishti, so for uh, internal wounds. So basically, when if your guts aren't that good, it's it's good. But it, that's the, um, the it inhibits the the salicylic acid in the slatta dua inhibits the inflammation response uh, in, in in the gut. Oh, and you know, the botanical anorak in me loves the fact that in this book they've actually preserved a plant. So there was obviously a dried specimen put in that book that they kept. Uh, and I don't know where that is, I'm sure it's still in the original. Okay, then we know gorse, winds, um, it's uh, here, there's just a single line that it says it's very good to make. The juice, take the juice and use it for coughs. That was a new one for me, I didn't know about that one. Okay, that's from Mean Lara up near where the photograph I took at Crawford is. 
And then this is a beautifully laid out page where they give you the names of the plant. And so you've got the Irish and the English, and then unlice the cure uh, associated with it. So they talk about uh, Finstry, which is the, the, the cornflower, um, and the cupog, uh, the, 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 the dock here. Um, and these are the, the list. So you can go and search these, and there's all sorts of information. And they're not only in Irish, obviously, because you know, most national schools in the country have them. There's some in English. So here's an English entry uh, from Tully Moore. And they talk here about hemlock. Obviously, hemlock's a poison. Um, they talk about farland. So this is buttercup. And they, I love this, it says, grows through the potatoes crops and smothers them, but it's good for, for butter. <laughs> so, so the, uh, cuckoo sorrel, it's probably oxalis sorrel. It's, I love this, it's good for the thirst. So that's the, you know, the little shamrock shaped plant that is sour, uh, so it's good if you're, 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 you're thirsty. And then there's a few others. There's one, uh, heart seeds, which is um, pansy, uh, viola tricolor. Uh, so there's all of this information there. So I'm going to wrap up. And what I tried to do tonight was to talk about how we live in a garden. And like most gardens, it's got plants in it. But the, the plants that grow on earth are for much more than beauty. They actually keep this whole system working. If it wasn't for plants, the earth system wouldn't operate the way it does. And I've used a few examples of plants in a global sense about how they maintain atmospheric climate, crop domestication took place around the world, and the importance of maintaining genetic diversity for future generations. And then I talk about local stuff. I talk about invasive species and the, the effect they can have locally. And I talk about the cures that humanity has drawn from, from plants uh, over the years. And I'd like to end by thanking you, and I love this image. This is the first time humans walked on the moon <laughs> and actually saw our planet from, from outside. And it's that view of the planet from the outside that I think opens our, the way we think about the planet, but also our role in the planet and the role of plants in the planet. And thanks very much for listening. <laughs>
make, you know, jokes about this, and he said, so what would the characteristics of those organisms be? And he says, they have to be photosynthetic. So they have to use the, the sunlight or the light from the nearest star and have a mechanism to transform that, way, that light energy into chemical energy. And so then they say, well, if they have, then they're going to have to have things like leaves that, you know, like photovoltaic cells that intercept that. So what I would expect is that there are lots of, if life exists on another planet and it's complicated, complex and not just microbes, they'll probably have plant-like characteristics. And if I found that planet, I wouldn't need to take any earth plants with me for fear they'd go invasive. <laughs> Very interesting question. Yes, you mentioned there was a plant or a tree that was very large once and very small now. What was the name of that one? Okay, so in the, the fossil is called, it's got a number of names, Stigmaria. Um, but the plant that exists now is called Isoetes. Uh, they're called quillworts. And they, you'll find them in the mineral poor lakes in this part of the world. Uh, and they look like grass, so when you get to the edge of the lake, especially if there's a bit of a gravel edge, you look down and you'll see things that look like grasses. Um, but if you lift them out, and then, so, so, so grass leaf will go straight down like that, and then it'll wrap around the, the plant. These guys will do that, but then they'll form a very a swollen base, and inside that swollen base is a thing that looks like a seed. And that's how you can identify them. So there are probably about 20 species worldwide of these. There's one species that grows around here. And that's all that's left of that huge family that formed the first forest 340 million years ago. But they're still there. <laughs> the plants help each other. Ah, yeah. Because yeah, I, I always had this idea they were very competitive, but having done some reading, the sense I got was they really cooperative and yeah. this community. Yeah, so so they do compete. Uh, they compete for light, and one of the things you see is that if you've got a big plant here and a smaller plant here, and this guy's in the shade, it's going to try to grow away. Okay, so yeah. but your question is about is there cooperation? Um, I'm not sure it's cooperation. It might be, and I'm saying I'm not sure, and that's because I, I really don't know. It's not, I'm not disagreeing. I just don't know. But what we do know is that they're communicating. They're, they're talking to each other. Because what plants, and, and they're talking to each other through the roots. So the roots are secreting lots of small organic compounds into the soil. Uh, and some of these compounds are antibiotics. So they, they modify the microbiome around them. They kill some bugs and encourage the growth of others. But other plants also sense that. And so if you're a plant and I'm a plant, you know, my toes can feel the fact that your toes are secreting compounds in and so then I behave differently. So we know a lot about that. And the most exciting example for me of this potential communication is in forest trees. So you've got these tall trees and they produce these massive root networks. And where roots cross each other, they can fuse, even if they're different species. And so now you've got this capacity for plants to be connected to each other and exchange information that way. That means that there is the possibility that communication between the plants is important, but we don't know that for sure. Okay. But I think it's, it's likely that you know, they're not growing in isolation, they're very aware of what plants are growing around them, and they'll be using light and chemicals and then these fusion bridges to evaluate if they're there. An extreme example of communication is seen in parasitic plants. So there's a, a weed in Africa called witch weed that infects grasses. Now, maize and wheat are grasses. So the infestation of wheat and maize crops by this witch weed can be catastrophic. So a farmer can lose 
of his or her crop because of this infection. And what happens there is the witch weed produces loads of tiny little seeds. And then these seeds sense that there's a grass near them because the grass secrete little molecules, these organic molecules into the soil. And the parasitic seed senses those and knows there's a grass nearby, so it germinates. And then it grows straight to the host plant, inserts a hostorium, it's like an infection structure, into the root of the host, and then sucks sugars out of the plant, and then it, it grows, and that's how it works. So it hijacks this communication system that plants have to parasitize uh, a crop host. Very intriguing area. And where I live, I have about seven acres of bog and rock and ground that's no good to any farm or bar maybe a week's worth of grazing on it. Um, I have no use for it. And I've thought in the past of getting trees. Yeah. There's lots of schemes out there to plant trees. So one is that a good idea? Because, or should I just leave it to be as it is? And two, when I spoke to a friend about it, he cautioned me and said, well, if you're looking for native Irish trees, make sure you get native Irish trees grown in Ireland, as opposed to native Irish trees grown in Scandinavia. Yeah. So is that an issue? Yeah, it really is an issue. So if I start at the last part, so one of the themes that I've tried to thread through tonight's talk is the importance of genetic diversity. And the genetic diversity of trees grown in Ireland will reflect, say, take for ash for example. Ash probably started growing here around 7,000 years ago. And the plants that arrived here will have arrived from probably Spain, France. And all that time they were adapting to the local environment you know, in, in that part of France, Spain. And then they arrived here and they've been adapting. So there's a long history of adapting. Now, you take plants from Scandinavia, they've adapted to a completely different environment. So they may grow well, but they're unlikely to grow optimally. Yeah. Now, that's one issue, but there is another issue. And the issue is, and this is why we had, this is one of the reasons we've got ash dieback in the country, is that ash trees that were grown in France were brought over and they carried the disease with them. Okay. The disease was coming anyway, it was blown on the wind, so it would have come. But it meant it was catastrophic in a few areas very quickly. So you should try, if possible, to find locally adapted crops, uh, trees for, for, for growing. And Chagas have a, a pretty good record in, in helping people do this through and culture too. So that's one thing. The, the first part of your question is much more philosophical. Um, so, uh, and so, for example, Pete. But it's not Pete now. It's just it's just rock and. and oh, it's just rock. It's okay. just rock and, and, and swamp or whatever. What okay. I call it. I'm, I'm okay, using the right terms. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's Pete in it. It's okay. a, it's a, it's a gra bit of ground in South Dharma actually, where I'm from. Right. Yeah. And um, so. Yeah, it's it's just you know you need wellies to get between the different peaks and rocks, but it's so rushes so and, 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 and heathers and things like that are growing there. Okay, so then like alders would be would be good. So in I know there's a lot of schemes in Britain because the 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 they've neglected the the riverbanks and wetting areas because most of them have been drained because. Yeah, for you know, for agriculture. So then you get these rivers that tend to overflow and it um, and cause all sorts of havoc. And now there's schemes to grow trees along to maintain the riverbank. So all there is is one of the good ones. So you know, all there is a, is a, is a type of plant. But again, it would be you'd be looking to some plant local all there. Um, even though it's not peaty, and um, these wetlands are. Um, carbon sinks, so they store carbon. So there's always the, the, the balance of, you know, is, is it going to result in a big release of carbon into the atmosphere or is it going to pull it back down? And, you know, I, 
there's calculations to do that, and I don't know, you know what it is. But then this is this highlights an issue, which is okay. We know what's the right thing to do, you know, for the climate, for the Earth system. But actually, you know, where's the economic incentive? You know, so you know, if if you were told no, you can't do that because you know of global warming. Well, you're being penalised. But you know, if I live in Dublin Four, you know, and I cycle into Doyle Air, you know, it's you know, I'm not affected. You know? And so, so there's always, in my experience, that the conservation programs that have been successful around the world have always been ones where they really consider all sides of the equation. And I think your example is a very good example of that, where you know we really need to look at this from both sides to make it sustainable. Well, Liam, thank you so much again, and uh, uh, it was just an absolutely wonderful talk, and uh, hopefully you'll come back again and we'll give us another talk. So, uh, um, I'd like to everybody to put their hands up. So, what Seamus is alluding to the fact that there's, there's one of these plants, and actually the, it's present in that carboniferous coal swamp that I showed you from 340 million years. The plants still exist, a very close relative, uh, called Ecosetum in Latin, uh, horsetail or mare's tail, and they can cause a lot of havoc around houses because they're the rooting systems. They're not as bad as Japanese knotweed but you can see them growing around a lot of uh, places. And it's quite hard to control, so Roundup and glyphosate doesn't control it. Um, the broadleaf weed killer that you might use on lawn can, can, can control it a little. But we did a, an experiment a few weeks ago where we got little um, clothes detergent and sprayed it. <laughs> 24 hours before we treated it with the herbicide. And there, you know, there was a reason for this. Because if you pick up a mare's tail and look at it, it's got a very waxy surface. And so the thought is, is that that waxy surface is stopping <laughs> the herbicide getting in. So we sprayed it with our little detergent. This isn't an advert for little. Uh, <laughs> and then we went around and hit it with this broadly herbicide. And we did a control because we're scientists. We did another patch where we didn't treat it with the detergent. And uh, a month later, the stuff that hadn't got the detergent, it looked a bit ropey, but it was still growing fine, whereas the other stuff was completely dead. So, uh, so it,